Well, good evening. My name is Stephanie Blank. I am a trustee of the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation and married to its namesake. And um, this is the third this year of our speaker series. And we are so excited about tonight's program. And for those of you who had the uh, forethought to wear green, you get extra brownie points. Penny, obviously, our foundation president, is resplendent in green this evening. And speaking of green, those very phrases, green, sustainable, alternative, eco-anything, environmentalist, tree hugger, these words immediately bring to mind many images, ideas, and thoughts, some positive, some not so positive. And the truth is, for most Americans, they have very conflicted views on what it means to be environmentally responsible, both for themselves personally and from a public standpoint. I know I have felt the tug between being practical, pragmatic, budget conscious, and being green and good. Does it have to be this way? Can we be both the environmentalist and the business person? Can we save our natural resources without draining our cash resources? Albert Hubbard has said, genius is the ability to act rightly without precedent. It's the power to do the right thing the first time. The notion of doing right the first time is the very essence of the message of our speaker tonight. Many of you know William McDonough as an internationally renowned architect and designer who in 1999 was named a hero for the planet by Time magazine and was renamed that in 2007. In 2003, he earned the US EPA Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award and in 2004 received the National Design Award for achievement in the field of environmental design. Mr. McDonough also co-authored the seminal book, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things. He is the founding principal of William McDonough and Partners, an internationally recognized design firm practicing ecologically, socially, and economically intelligent architecture and planning. But this is not why he is most important to me. I told someone just a few minutes ago that for me, he is like a Pied Piper. I first came to know him thanks to South Face. I don't know if the people from South Face are here this evening. Ready? There you are. And I was so oh, just blown away by what I heard that evening and how he delivered that message. He has the ability to inspire a whole entirely new vision for how we look at our world. His passion and commitment when you listen to or read his words spark within us the desire to do our part to correct the course of human progress to ensure that our future generations have the quality of life they deserve. So ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to welcome William McDonough. Hi, everybody. This is a great, we were talking about this earlier, this is a great room uh, in which to give a speech because it's uh, intimate and I can see all of you. It's terrific. Usually I'm blinded and looking into the black void. So it's great to see everyone here. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about a celebration of abundance because I think for a lot of people in the environmental movement, it's time for us to talk about how great the world is, not simply how limited our resources are because we actually have an astonishing reserve of, of potential that is connected to human design and the potentials of human design. So that's what I'd like to talk about tonight, something that we live and something that we dream about. Now, before I start, I'd like to just give you a frame condition. Somebody asked me the other day if I would do this for a talk, and I did it, and I think it was helpful. Um, just to give you a sense of what I do and where I come from, I am an architect and have a firm called William McDonough and Partners, and I'll show you some buildings later. Uh, I also co-founded with German chemist Michael Braungard a company called McDonough Braungard Design Chemistry, and we do assessments of products and certify products against our protocols for ecological and human health. 
And I'm now a venture partner at Vantage Point Venture Partners, a $4 billion plus venture capital fund in California, investing in clean tech and other uh, ventures. So I'm, I'm in the business world with one foot and in the chemistry world uh, uh, with my sort of dreams and with, in the architecture world with my other foot. Now, tonight I'd like to talk about design as the first signal of human intention. And I've come here from Charlottesville, Virginia, where I've had the privilege of living in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. And when you live in a house designed by Mr. Jefferson, you think of him as your architect. And to have Thomas Jefferson as an architect means that you think of him as a designer. And you realize that he saw himself as a designer too, because all you have to do is look at his last design, which was his tombstone. And you'll notice that on it, he only recorded the things he designed. It says Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and uh, the University of Virginia. You realize that th this is a, a person who is only recording his legacies, not his activities. There is absolutely no mention of having been president of the United States twice. So the idea that we would record our legacies instead of our activities, not our jobs, but what we left behind, is really fundamental to design and fundamental to the idea of a sustaining design. And if we look at his design, we realize that he talks about natural rights and the pursuit of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But we also realize that he understood the concept of sustainability across generations because he wrote a letter to James Madison in 1789 when they were trying to design the federal government. And in this letter, he said, uh, they were trying to determine the, t the term of a federal bond. What should the borrowing, the length of the borrowing power be of the federal government? And, and he d decided it should be one generation. And his proposal was 19 years. And his logic was this. He said, the earth belongs to the living. The earth belongs to the living. No man may by natural right oblige the lands he owns or occupies to debts greater than those that may be paid during his own lifetime. Because if he could, then the world would belong to the dead and not to the living. The world would belong to the dead. So this idea that the world would belong to the living, I think, is a fundamental idea and the one I'd like to talk about today. And we, we look at this idea of natural rights that he talks about, of, of humans, and I think we can expand that to thinking about the rights of nature itself. And so if design is a signal of human intention, what is our intention at this point in history as a species? Because we now dominate the entire planet. It's very clear that the human being dominates the planet. 99% of the large mammals are under human management. We're finding six times as much plastic as plankton in the Pacific gyre north of Los Angeles in the Pacific Ocean. We see toxification, persistent uh, toxins, 500 known chemicals that are, have, have uh, contaminated uh, uh, various species around the globe. Uh, one of the greatest chemical experiments ever undertaken without controls. So what is our intention as a species? We are now the dominant species. Well, I think that it's time for us to call for declarations of interdependence and look at the rights of nature itself. Because if we look at the history of rights, what we recognize, and this is, by the way, a picture of a roof. This is the roof at the assembly plant that we designed for Ford Motor Company. And in the lower left corner, you'll see killdeer eggs. Uh, there are birds nesting here. I'll show you some more later. Uh, the idea was to design a building where instead of leaving asphalt, as a roof, which in our lexicon would be two words assigning blame, that we would, <laughs> we would create a habitat for hundreds of species on top of the building while we save Ford millions of dollars. And, and this idea of, of honoring the rights of nature itself, I think, is a fundamental one to, for our time. And so the first question that we would have to ask in our design is how do we love all the children of all species for all time? not just our children, not just our species, and not just now. This is a question that I think we can ask as a species. So we'll need a goal if we're going to do this. So I've tried to cram a goal into one sentence. 
Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. <laughs> now, what part of this don't we like? Now, I was asked uh, uh, to present this for the Bush White House twice, uh, which to me was an anthropological field trip, as you can well imagine. <laughs> and uh, when I got there, I was asked by somebody, well, what do I think of clean nuclear power? And I'm a big fan of clean nuclear power. Now, there are a lot of environmentalists that are, are moving towards looking at nuclear power as a blessing because it doesn't have the carbon issues. That's another debate that I think we all have to take up as a species, frankly. But what I'm excited about is nuclear fusion. And I'm very excited about the fact that we already have our nuclear reactor exactly where we need it, 93 million miles away. It's eight minutes. It's wireless. Uh, what is our problem? So. Uh, I, I love nuclear power, and I think all of us as planetary citizens can, can enjoy that prospect and celebrate its abundance. Now, if we look at the history of the human being uh, and, is, and our survival on the planet, we have developed two fundamental syndromes of survival. Um, the guardian and commerce has been pointed out by Jane Jacobs, the urban theorist. And so we have been somewhere in our, in our last few hundred years between socialism and capitalism. And various cultures take different positions along that continuum. The Russians down here and the Americans over here and things like that. But this problem with these is that any ism is a dangerous thing because it's too extreme. Um, we find, you know, Nazism, sexism, racism, socialism, capitalism, isms are dangerous things because they're too extreme and certainly aren't good for the environment. A pure socialist is not good for the environment. The former USSR has been declared 16% uninhabitable. Uninhabitable. Uh, a pure capitalist is not good for the environment because we cut down the trees and forget the fish, for example. So, so any extremism is a dangerous thing. Now, as we bring the environment into, into our mix into the, in the next century, what we have is another ism, which we have to be really careful about, which we could call ecologism. <laughs> And an ecologism would be just as dangerous as any other ism because it would be too extreme. This is where we find the deep ecologists, for example, who say that the human being is a scourge on the face of the earth and needs to be effectively eliminated in, in mo the most part in order for the natural world to recover. This is too extreme a position. And so what we're looking for is this famous balance of ecology, equity, and economy that has become the th triad of sustainable development. So we've developed a fractal tool that helps us design and look for 100% fabulous things where we, we bring together ecology, equity, and economy. And if we look at this fractal, we can realize that, that this corner here is the economy corner, and this corner here is the economy corner of the economy corner. So it's economy, economy. What is the question in that corner? Well, the question would be, can I make it at a, and sell it at a profit? And the answer, if the answer to that question is no, then don't do it. Because by definition, you can't be in business if you're not having income. And income is a very important part of the strategy we'll get to in a minute. Um, this question would be what? This is the equity corner of the economy corner. This would be, are people earning a living wage, for example? This would be the economy corner of the equity corner. What is the question there? Equity first, economy second. Are men and women being paid the same for the same work? Equity, equity, nothing to do with economy, nothing to do with ecology. What's the question? Uh, this is where we would find things like racism and sexism. Uh, nothing to do with m money or, the, or ecology, just pure social condition. This would be the ecology corner of the equity corner. Is it fair to sell people products that contain carcinogens or to uh, ask workers to work with carcinogens in workplaces, for example? The ecology sector, uh, the equity corner, is it fair to burden future generations with climate change or persistent toxification on a global basis? Ecology, ecology, am I following nature's laws? Ecology, economy, am I being effective with the natural world as a, as, as a uh, effective? 
Thank you. With the natural world. And then here would be efficiency. Now, the, the problem that we've seen in the environmental movement, I think, in part, is that we've basically focused down in here with business for social responsibility and corporate social responsibility reporting and eco-efficiency. Because we have eco-efficiency, we have profit, and we have business, business first for social responsibility. And what we need to do is actually go out to these other edges to really understand what it means to be fair and equitable, not just with our own species, but with the other species on the planet. So what I'd like to talk about today is this cradle to cradle approach to design that looks at this question and asks fundamentally, what does it mean to become native to the planet? Now, a friend of mine, uh, who is uh, a chief of the Onondaga people, was asked by the United Nations to come to a, give a speech at the UN for the Indigenous Peoples Conference. And his question was, well, who's not indigenous? <laughs> you know, that was his question, because at this point, it's a planetary question. I mean, how many people in this room can feel that they're indigenous people, right? But the question is, when do we start to feel indigenous once again, and what does it mean for someone to be an indigenous person? Well, at the Hanford nuclear plant, where we store our plutonium for our bombs and missiles, they had a symposium of scientists and semiologists, scientists and sign makers, come to discover how to make a sign that we could leave where we stored the plutonium so that even an extraterrestrial, 5,000 years from now, wouldn't dare to dig. <laughs> okay, this was the actual assignment. And uh, what I would call the semiology of extreme danger, right? What is the mark on the ground? And the Yakima people who were there for another meeting heard what the scientists were doing and started laughing and said, you know, you really don't need to worry about this. We'll tell them where it is. <laughs> they weren't leaving. So what happens is like the Jeffersonian point is what if we're not leaving? What if we intend to be here 5,000 years from now? What would our designs look like? If we, design, if we designed ourselves to be native to this place. And I think that's the question that is required now in our new consciousness since the 1968 image uh, from Apollo um, of the Earth from outer space, where our consciousness changed. And we can start talking about spaceship Earth, like Buckminster Fuller and so on, from an engineering perspective. Um, and our, but our consciousness has basically recognized that this beautiful, a uh, blue green orb uh, is our home will be for thousands of years and we might as well decide to stay and if we decide to stay what does our design look like well our designs haven't really changed that much because since 1968 our consciousness has but we still design the same buildings we just make them a little more efficiently for, for example but we need a fundamental shift in order for us to 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 change uh, the way our species is acting on the planet. And so when we look at our science, what it tells us is things like this. This is the Pacific gyre. Six times as much plastic as plankton. Here, scientists found three years ago out of Los Angeles. Comes from the west coast of the United States in our stormwater systems. What else do we know? 48% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide that produced by humans since 1850 is in the oceans. And the ocean's pH, which was historically from 8.2 to 8.8, .8, which we can tell from the Ross Ice Shelf cores, uh, is now at 8.06. It's expected by end of century that it'll get to 7.9 pH with the current releases of carbon dioxide. At 7.9 pH, water effectively turns into carbonic acid and drops out the bottom of the food chain. It dissolves the coral reefs. So if our design is to cause climate change, persistently toxify, uh, put particles into the air, pollute our rivers, fill the oceans with plastics, destroy the bottom of the food chain, we are doing great <laughs> if that's the plan. But if that's not the plan, what is the plan? We don't have a plan. We need a plan. So what I'd like to talk about today is an alternative plan. And I, th I think that we'd like to use this as our inspiration because of the millions of years of R&D that have been undertaken here. Um, if, we look at the, if we look at this as a design ins inspiration, 
we recognize that the natural world, and this is a picture from Irian Jaya of rainforest, 250 species per hectare of tree. Um, I look at these vertical lines and realize that this is known as gravity, and as an architect, it's not just a good idea for me to pay attention to that. It's the law. <laughs> so what other laws might there be in this picture that would help us design uh, intelligently? So in 1991, 92, I wrote a book called The Hanover Principles uh, with Dr. Braungart, and it was the design guidelines for the World's Fair for the year 2000. And then in 2002, as we heard, um, we wrote a book called Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things. And the book is plastic. Uh, now, why would you do a book in plastic? Yeah. So, um, save paper. Save paper. Good idea. Now, if we think about the book in plastic, one of the great things about thinking about trees is how amazing trees can be. And if you look at a tree as a design assignment, what does it do? If I asked you, you know, this requires incredible humility at this point in history. It took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> you know, we're not that smart. <laughs> if, you th if, you think, if you think about a tree, here's this thing. If I asked you to design a tree, I'd ask you to design something that makes oxygen, sequesters carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, provides habitat for hundreds of species, accrues solar energy as fuel, makes complex sugars and foods, changes colors with the seasons, creates microclimates, and self-replicates. How are we doing? Right? <laughs> we have wheels on our luggage. <laughs> so how many things that humans have made lately that make oxygen? So what I'll show you are buildings that make oxygen. Because it's a fundamental kind of question at this point about human artifice. And so we made the book out of plastic to point out the idea of what we call technical nutrition, the idea that things could go into infinite closed cycles uh, by human manufacture. Now, one of the points we made in the book is that being less bad is not being good. It's being bad, just less so, <laughs> and by definition. So I could leave Atlanta tomorrow and, and head south towards Florida, but if I'm supposed to be going to Charlottesville, I'm going the wrong direction. It's not going to help me to slow down to 20 if I'm going 100 miles an hour unless I'm slowing down to turn around. But I'm going in the wrong direction. So we, we can't just be less bad. It won't be sufficient to what we need to do. We need to actually change our design completely so that it becomes part of the natural world. And the tendency of humans is to, is to, to get worried and then start to regulate. But a regulation in this context is a signal of design failure. A regulation is a signal of design failure, because it's, a com it's the community at large saying to someone, oh, you're releasing cadmium into the river, we'll tell you at what rate you can dispense death. Because the right to dispense death has been held by society in The, in the Guardian. See, the, the, we've created the state, the Guardian, and commerce business as the two syndromes of survival. And the Guardian is very slow, it's very serious, it reserves the right to kill, it reserves the right to be duplicitous. The CIA is legal. Uh, the Guardian uh, is different than commerce. Commerce is very fast. It's very efficient. It's very effective. It's highly creative. And it's fundamentally honest, because you can't do business with somebody very long if you're not honest with them. And as Jane Jacobs points out, if you get the two together, you get what she calls a monstrous hybrid. The mafia would be a good example. It does business, but reserves the right to kill. It's, <laughs> it's a problem, right? So. These two things have to be kept separate. So a regulation by the Guardian is a signal to commerce of design failure. So what I'll show you today are some products that we've designed with the companies we work with where we've removed the need to be regulated. We've taken the textile industry, which is famously using 8,000 chemicals every day, and developed whole protocols for chemicals that make textiles that are so clean, they clean the water in the factories. And water, drinking water goes in and drinking water comes out. And this, this, these are unregulated products because there's nothing to regulate. It's a change of fundamental design. And so we use the cherry tree as a, as a, uh, a model. And people celebrate the abundance of a cherry tree. We don't look at a cherry tree in the spring and say, oh my goodness, how, how inefficient can you be? How many blossoms does it take? You know, we, we celebrate the fact that we end up with this incredible exuberance and abundance of the natural world. We don't look at Mozart or listen to Mozart and think, 
oh, you know, how many notes does it take? <laughs> you know, I mean, he could have hit the piano with a two by four and we got them all at once. <laughs> you know, very efficient, but would we love it? So what we're looking for is this idea of effectiveness instead of efficiency. And the effectiveness, and this is, I think, what was what we were hearing about in about doing the right thing. The effectiveness first, I think, is fundamental because growth is good. If you ask a child, what is it like to grow? Is that good? Yeah. There you go. If you ask a tree what it's like to grow, this, this is natural. Growth is good. And so one of the problems with modern environmental uh, uh, concern is that, that we, we have to worry about growth because it's bad. It's because the design is bad. The concept of growth itself has to be celebrated, as I'll talk about in a minute. But we have to celebrate it because it's the right thing, not because we're growing the wrong thing, but because we're growing the right thing. Peter Drucker, uh, the famous management consultant, pointed out that it was uh, uh, a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. But it's an executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. Because if you're doing the wrong thing the right way, you might actually be pernicious. Think of a Nazi, right? An efficient Nazi is worse than an inefficient Nazi. So is efficiency a good? Not if you're a Nazi, right? Efficiency has no value per se. It's like a tool. A hammer has no value. The value of the hammer is the purpose to which it's put. If we build a house for people who need a home with a hammer, a hammer is a good thing. If I hit you in the forehead with it, it's a bad thing. The hammer doesn't know if it's good or bad. Efficiency doesn't know if it's good or bad. The question is, are we doing the right thing first? Then are we doing it the right way? So it's important to be efficient, but only after we've figured out what the effective answer is. And so. Let me just look at the science of the last century for inspiration for designers. We look at E equals MC squared, Einstein's special theory of relativity, for its inspiration. And if you look at this formula, what you recognize is that C is a very large number. It's 186,000 miles per second. If you square it, it's almost infinite, which means that if M is in any way a positive number, then E is almost infinite. And this is why Hiroshima and Nagasaki disappeared because a very small amount of M can yield an almost infinite amount of energy. This is the nuclear equation. Now, it's quite amazing for us to realize if from a poetic perspective, I'm obviously not a scientist, that if we look at the sun as physics, we realize that's energy. That's kinetic energy transformed into photons that strike the Earth's surface. They travel 93 million miles in eight minutes, and they're wireless. Wow. There's thousands of times more sun striking the Earth's surface, variously estimated between five and 10,000 times more sun striking the Earth's surface than humans will ever need, even with 10 billion of us. So why don't we set about capturing that energy? It's clean, it's safe, our nuclear reactor is right where we need it. And, um, and it's, 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 it's uniformly distributed over the planet uh, in a way that is ultimately uh, fair. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Now, if we look at chemistry, we realize that chemistry is mass in Einstein's equation, and that the inorganic chemistry of the Earth, the rocks and the water, oops, the rocks and the water um, are struck by this energy from the sun, and in this magical thing that happens, we get biology. Now, before we leave mass, what we realize is that from a design perspective, if we take all the chromium out of South Africa and put it in products and distribute them around the world and throw them into little holes in the ground or burn them in incinerators when we finish with them, future generations are going to be looking back at us and saying, what were you thinking? You took this, this material that is very valuable, it's toxic, you distributed it all over the planet, you put it in little holes, you toxified us, and you removed it from our utility for future generations. What were you thinking? What was your design? Was your intention, the design is intention, was your intention to, to toxify us and to remove the chromium from our utility? 
So these, these have to be thought of as very valuable nutrients for future generations, not just as toxics, toxins for present generations. This is a really important idea. Now, when we put physics and chemistry together, we get the thing that Einstein didn't deal with, which is biology, life itself. And so to look at life itself, we can look at Crick. Francis Crick, nine years after discovering DNA with James Watson in 1953, he looked at what he called the nature of vitalism. What does it mean for something to be a living thing? And his conclusion was, in order to be alive, you had to have growth, you had to have free energy from sunlight, and you had to have an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism and its reproduction. Growth, free energy from sunlight, and open metabolism. So we've talked about growth. We've talked about free energy from sunlight. What I'd now like to talk about is this open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism and its reproduction. So what Dr. Braungart and I have proposed is that we look at materials and systems in terms of biological metabolisms and technical metabolisms and par parse the making of things into two fundamental categories. Those things that are designed to return to the natural world and those things that are designed to stay within technical cycles. And so we end up with biological nutrients, things that are designed to go back to soil like fabrics and things that aren't going to be put back into technical re reuse, where we need to rebuild our soils and make them healthy again. And, and we've been losing soil at a fierce rate on a planetary basis. And we also look at what we call technical nutrients, those things that you want, from which you want the service, but not necessarily the ownership of the molecules or are going to return those molecules back to the soil or to the air or to water. These would be things like this computer, our cars, uh, plastic carpets, things like that. We call them products of service. What we want is the service, not necessarily the ownership of the molecules. And these things can be designed to go back and into cycles. And I'll explain that a little bit further. Then the question would no longer be to grow or not grow, but what do we want to grow? And we could choose those things we want to grow, rather than have these de facto plans yield these things that we don't want to see growing, like asphalt. So what is our target and what is our trajectory? Um, looking at Peter Drucker's strategy for efficiency and effectiveness, what we've recognized in working with the Department of Defense, where we're, we've been working with DOD on the idea of solar powering the military. And it's an interesting client to have because the US military is the largest single user of energy in the world. And so we've developed with them this chart um, which is relatively simple to help everybody understand it. And essentially, using military terminology, we developed a flight path and basically said, what if we try and work out what is 100% sustainable look like in all these different sectors? What does it mean to be optimally sustainable in all these sectors in terms of diversity or in terms of energy and so on and so forth? So let's just take 100% renewably powered as a, as a goal. This is one that we've been working on. Ren renewable energy. And this is something that the, the new administration is very focused on. So what if we did that? Well, what we discover is that efficiency, which is really critical to this agenda, is the first thing to do, clearly. It has the best cost-benefit analysis um, and is, is, is uh, uh, very valuable in the short term. Insulating houses, uh, weather stripping, things like that are infinitely more productive than putting up solar collectors in the first instance. So you get this value proposition up front very fast. But, but here's the point we want to make sure everybody understands. It's insufficient to the task. Because you could reduce the amount of fossil fuel and nuclear power you're using, for example, to the minimum. But that doesn't mean that you've reached 100% renewable energy. You've only started on the path. And so what we need is this effective strategy that starts to do R&D and looks at what it means to become 100% renewably powered. And you realize that efficiency helps us because it moves this inflection point closer in time. So as a national protocol, what we should be doing is massive efficiency on a global basis uh, and, then, and then massive renewables 
at the same time. And I think we're really ready to see this. And what's exciting about this to me is that this really represents leadership. Somebody that wants to find leadership as, as or a leader, as a person who takes you to a place that you never would have gotten to by yourself. And um, I think that if we look at this, what we need now is immense leadership in this space. And we might, we might be starting to see it, especially when we start to see things like uh, countries in the Middle East investing in renewables. I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, Abu Dhabi has just committed $30 billion to a new town called Mazdar, uh, which will be built in the desert, a carbon neutral city. And as they're developing it, they're identifying all the technologies that are needed to make a carbon neutral city, and they're buying new technologies. So they, once they identify which company is going to make the solar collectors that they're going to need, they're buying into that company. Uh, to, to help uh, expand this protocol on a global basis. And so when the oil producing countries start to do this, what you see is, is uh, the fact that we've left the building. Renewables have, have, are, are now on track to be immensely cost effective at grid parity uh, within the next decade for sure. There's really very little question in most people's minds who work in this space that new, renewable power in various forms will be a grid parity within this decade or the next decade. And um, we're already seeing it now with wind power. I'm sure you've heard about, you know, T. Boone Pickens and his plan and things like that. But we're seeing uh, renewable energy coming in in very uh, cost effective ways. So the, the design principles we use are waste equals food, use current solar income and celebrate diversity. So those, those are the fundamentals of the work. Now let me show you some of the work itself and tell you a little bit about my history and how I got here. I, I was born in Tokyo, Japan in 1951, and um, my dad was a foreign language officer in MacArthur's staff. And uh, we lived in a little house in Tokyo, and I remember lying in my futon at night and listening to the, to the ox carts come in at night to clean out our latrines. And I remember my mother with her sort of sing-song voice, she's from Alabama, talking about the honey wagons coming to pick up the night soil. That's what it was called, night soil. So these euphemisms, you know, the honey wagons coming to pick up the night soil. And being a little kid, you know, these are stories about poop. This is all very exciting. <laughs> so, so we were very excited about the honey wagons coming to pick up our night soil. But the whole idea of the, the image of, the, of our sewage going off to the farmers to become the vegetables that we would ultimately eat, the tofu, the meats, and so on, was really a fundamental part of that story. So it was in the morning, uh, the ox carts would come back into the city, bringing in the, the product, produce of the, uh, of the farms that used our, our night soil for their farming. And so there was this direct connection with, with our sustenance and our, our sustaining agenda with the farming. Then in uh, 1960, uh, I lived in Hong Kong, and uh, we, we lived in a place with 6 million people on 40 square miles. And during the dry season, we had four hours of water every fourth day. And so we would collect water in thimbles. We would collect water in, in every bathtub that we could fill, any pot we could fill. We had to boil the water to drink it. Everybody on the island had to deal with this. It was before the pipeline from China was there. And, and this became ordinary life. So during my time there, what I recognized is that the people had a fundamentally different relationship to the land. This land has been continuously farmed for 5,000 years. Now, how do you farm the same piece of dirt for 5,000 years if you don't understand nutrient flow? You have to understand the idea that you would replace nutrients uh, in order to continuously farm without synthetic chemicals and synthetic energy. And so this whole ethos that developed around that is really fundamental, and it's a very tight equation. That human waste was really important. In fact, in ancient China, it was impolite to leave someone's house in the country without leaving a deposit uh, <laughs> because you were taking away their nutrients after a meal. Right? They needed to restore their soils. It was, it's a fundamental uh, act. Now, I spent my childhood summers in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State and Hood Canal and, and the Puget Sound. 
where my grandparents lived in a log cabin, and they saved they saved aluminum foil and rubber bands, and uh, you know caught salmon and uh, raised oysters, uh, things like that. Lived very frugally. My grandfather had been a lumberjack there and retired there, and uh, and so I lived in the summers in this world of abundance, a world of abundance, but everybody was really careful about everything. And then in 1969, my dad became the president of Seagram overseas, the wines and spirits business, working for the Brompons. And we moved to New York and Connecticut. And all of a sudden, I lived in a town where 16-year-olds had Porsches and that we landed on the moon. <laughs> and the whole world was different. I remember going to high school and seeing the boys leaving the showers running in the, in the locker room with hot water after, after taking a shower and just letting it run. Uh, I remember being really shocked by it and and realized that I had come from a different place because that would have been unheard of where I came from. So I started my work as an architect. One of the projects that I built the first solar heated house in Ireland, which will give you a signal my ambition because there is no sun in Ireland. Um, and then went to New York to start my practice. And one of our first projects was for Environmental Defense Fund. We did their national headquarters, and we started asking building supply, materials suppliers what were in their products. And the, we wanted to know whether things were off-gassing, what was made, what they were made from, where the wood came from, uh, on and on and on. And the typical answer we got from a manufacturer was it's proprietary, it's legal, please go away. <laughs> well, we now work with companies whose annual revenues until recently uh, were a trillion and a half dollars. Uh, a year, so we're still at this asking these same questions of manufacturers and suppliers, uh, but the world has changed a little bit since then because that was 1984. Um, now here, this is the year 2000. Uh, all of a sudden, we start to see on the cover of Business Week uh, an article about our work and other people's work. But look at the language that's being used: killing, danger, sick. You know, and we're not here to talk about the killing dangers of sick buildings. What we're here to talk about is change. What we need is dramatic change quickly from what we used to do to what we should be doing and could be doing in the future. And so we have a very positive approach to this, not a negative approach. But clearly, when we send letters to manufacturers and ask them what's in their products, we get letters that even say, we are, they, we are assured that we do not know of all the comp components of our products. That's what's in our product. People don't know what's in their product. You'd be amazed how many things are made where we don't even know what's in them. I mean, you, really, truly amazing. There are over 100,000 chemicals being used by humans today to manufacture, 100,000. Less than a third of them have been tested for ecological and human health. Less than a third. Our databases are in the thousands of chemicals. Uh, we're trying to develop a protocol to allow us to, to develop the ecological and, and human health effect databases for all chemicals used by humans. We're very excited about it. But if you look at the way the human being has reacted to these kinds of anxieties, we start by regulating. And what do we regulate? Well, look at, the Cal look at California's Proposition 65. What did it result in? You know, amazing things that are now happening with the Green Chemistry Initiative and things like that, which we're helping with. But, but look at what Proposition 65 came out with. It, it required that we put warnings out, but not that we change the products. That we just warn you, this is a warning on the way into a government building in Sacramento. The state of California requires that we warn you that the property contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or the reproductive harm. These chemicals may be contained in emissions and fumes from the building materials, products and materials used to maintain the property, dot, 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 dot. So what do we do? We just tell everybody, get really scared. Uh, this is a scary world you're in. And, and we, we figure that's enough. Uh, we look at the uh, at high tech trashing. If you look at this picture from the Basel Action Network of a woman about to break open a CRT from a hospital in Los Angeles, which we shipped to China. She's about to expose herself and her children to four pounds of highly toxic lead in order to uh, recover some copper. So what do we do? We start with our materials by looking at restricted substances. And what we hope to see happening as uh, quickly as possible uh, facilitated by uh, the world of commerce and the world, the illusionary world of a full inventory and assessment of products 
and in the future an optimization of products so that based on these protocols we can do uh, design healthful things. So for our inventories, I'll give an example. The first step is inventory. We're textile seeding. We looked at 8,000 chemicals in the textile industry, designing a new textile for Steelcase Corporation. And out of the 8,000 chemicals, we assessed them for ecological and human health and found that we had to eliminate 7,962. We were left with 38 chemicals. And we did the entire fabric line with 38 chemicals. And now it's so safe you can eat the fabric. <laughs> and we're also delighted to point out that it's been chosen by the Airbus 380 as the fabric of choice because it's the most comfortable seating fabric. It wicks away moisture and insulates you, so it keeps you at one temperature and, and keeps you from getting bed sores while you're in a plane. But the fact that you can eat the, eat the fabric, it, we find exciting because if you found yourself as a frequent flyer like I do, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the fact that if I found myself with a serious fiber deficiency at 40,000 feet, I could eat my chair. Uh, is an amazing prospect. So uh, we did simple assessment of materials and substitutions and went from thousands of chemicals down to 38 chemicals. That assessment requires fundamental criteria. And so for human health, we use the criteria of no more cancer, no more disruption of our endocrine systems, no more genetic mutations, no more reproductive toxicity, and no more birth defects. And then we look at sensitizations, toxicities, and things like that. Here's that chart in English for most of us, um, that we really want to eliminate these things. And we can do this by design. There's no reason that we need to be slaves to old bad design when we can do new bad, new, new bad. We can do new good design. And so uh, the criteria for environmental health are uh, no more toxicity for vertebrates, invertebrates, and plants and water, no more bioaccumulation of dangerous substances. Mother's milk in Germany has been declared illegal to sell on a store shelf. If you analyze mother's milk, human mother's milk, it would not be legally sellable because of, its, of the bioaccumulation of toxic materials in mother's milk. Fortunately, the children's livers haven't developed that much as the, and they pass it through uh, as infants. Um, so. Uh, you know, these are really serious questions. Uh, we, can, we can look at how any culture treats its mother's milk for a fundamental test, litmus test, of its intelligence from an ecological and environmental health perspective. So these are the criteria for environmental health. And then we have production and process criteria, um, including exact knowledge of what things are made out of, where they come from, where they go, how do they affect society, and so on and so forth. So we have 19 fundamental criteria for ecological and human health. We then take each chemical and we rate it with a stop-go system. Green means little or no hazard. Yellow, low to moderate hazard. Red, high hazard, needs to be phased out. Orange cannot be characterized due to incomplete data. And we take each chemical and we're building this database one chemical at a time. What we'd like to do is get, get ourselves in a position where we can get some support so we can take the whole list of human chemicals and database them like this with these chemicals together so that we can make it public and offer the whole world a list of all the criteria of the chemicals being used in human manufacturing on a global basis. That's the dream. So this is formaldehyde, for example, which is a carcinogen, um, mutagen, or has reproductive toxic problems and so on and so forth. So it doesn't mean formaldehyde is a bad or a good, it just means that in context you have to be very careful about this. It's the same as looking at cadmium. When we look at cadmium, which is a toxic heavy metal, it's not a good or a bad. Cadmium doesn't know if it's good or bad. We get cadmium with zinc, man with zinc mining, so we're going to have cadmium in the world. What is really stupid is to take cadmium and put it in a battery that a kid could smash and get access to and get exposed to or in a waste or put in a landfill. What is, but on the other hand, using cadmium on a solar collector that is being um, consistently treated as a product of service by a solar power company is not a bad use of cadmium at all. In fact, it's a good place to put the cadmium. So, so it's not as simple as saying yes, no. It's about context as well. And we've developed a supply chain tool that allow companies to work up and down and communicate with all their suppliers uh, and their customers in a supply chain uh, continuum.
to talk about these issues and to improve their whole program. And so the, the movement is to make products that are nutrients, all products to get recycled one way or the other to biological or technical cycles, and we design the systems that help those things occur. So the criteria for the certification is around safe, healthy materials, reutilization, 100% renewable energy, clean water, and social responsibility. And we move from products that have contained large amounts of red to, uh, to optimized substances. And so I'll just show you some products and buildings and we'll be done. These are the textiles that will be in the Airbus. Here you see the trimmings of the cloth used to be declared hazardous waste in Switzerland and had to be shipped to Spain. Um, and when you think about it, if your trimming is declared hazardous waste but you can sell what's in the middle, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see the equal sign here. So, so now it's mulch for a local garden club or it's fiber for frequent flyers. Uh, here's a carpet we did with Warren Buffett and Shaw Industries. Uh, instead of simply saying that we're returning our carpet to technical cycles like a lot of the carpet companies in the green space, but they're still making PVC, Shaw retooled because Buffett, what Buffett realized is that PVC will be declared illegal in many countries. And so just it's not good enough just to take the carpet back as product of service. What we really need is a carpet that's really designed for recycling. And so we developed the, the carpet with Shaw Industries. They retooled and, um, and developed a carpet that is, has a nylon 6 uh, top, which goes back to infinite reuse as nylon 6 through a recycling facility. And the underlayment is a thermoplastic polyolefin, infinitely recyclable thermally as the base for carpet. Uh, Steelcase, Herman Miller, Hayworth, all the companies have adopted cradle to cradle certification for their products. So you can now get cradle to cradle chairs, uh, window shades. The U.S. Postal Service has adopted cradle to cradle for its, all of its um, priority mail uh, envelopes and boxes, 700 million units a year. So the questions are, are things recyclable and compostable? This is the Think Chair from Steelcase. Comes apart in five minutes, and the parts are all recyclable. Do you have reverse logistics? This is the Shaw carpet. It has the 15th largest uh, truck fleet in the country. Do you know how much carpet waste there is in America every year? Four and a half billion pounds. Imagine that. So right now, if you decide to change your carpet, typically you go from pink to red or something, you're destroying the planet. But under cradle to cradle, you would just change, you would just create jobs. Because imagine if the carpet was infinitely reusable and it was powered by solar energy and, a cl and clean water was the result of its water use and uh, it was pr practiced social fairness, then all you're doing is create jobs. So we could celebrate carpet as a way of celebrating human creativity rather than bemoan the carpet as toxic waste. We developed a car with Ford Motor Company, a concept car, the Model U, cradle to cradle car. Um, uh, Steelcase Corporation is now invested in an 8 megawatt wind farm in Texas to make its power. And the water is, uh, as I mentioned, is drinkable coming out of the factories we work in. And social fairness is a fundamental part of the continuum. This is the factory we designed for Herman Miller in Zeeland, Michigan, where all the office workers and the factory workers celebrate the same space. So that's the cradle to cradle certification. Now I'll just finish with some buildings. What if we could design a building like a tree? This is a building for Oberlin College. The project produces 13% more energy than it needs to operate right now. Uh, so the building is productive. It's producing more energy than it needs and purifies its own water in a, what's called a living machine. Here it is. For the Gap Corporation, now the headquarters of YouTube, um, a building with an undulating meadow of ancient grasses on the roof. This is a roof. For Herman Miller, we're restoring natural landscape while they make furniture in this factory that costs $49 a square foot. Uh, Butler building is $44 a square foot. So we had 10% more than a budget for a metal shed. And we were able to put in daylight fresh air in the Beach Boys and productivity doubled. For Nike, uh, their European headquarters, the largest geothermal system in Europe for buildings. Uh, it's heated and cooled from the ground, purifies its rainwater, uses it for the gardens. This is a new church we're designing in Pasadena, California for the Fuller Theological Seminary. 
a building is a musical instrument. This is the library across the, across the way. For Ford Motor Company, we designed the River Rouge plant. This is the site here, and the joke in Dearborn, Michigan is that's a color photograph. Um, <laughs> this is the, the new plant we designed right here. You can see it actually looks like that color photograph back there. Um, this is the landscape. Then we looked at the water systems and realized that Ford had budgeted 50, $48 million for water management uh, to meet the Clean Water Act on this site using conventional engineering. And we decided to use these tools, which are the native species of this place, built the factory, and using ecological engineering, which cost us $13 million, we saved Ford $35 million day one. And with the Ford Taurus at a 4% at a margin out of Chicago, this is the equivalent of an order for $900 million worth of cars. This is the roof. The birds arrived within five days and started nesting. These are killdeer. I got this picture last week. There's a Canada goose nesting on the roof. There are no foxes up there. <laughs> Just photographers. This is a, a project for a museum in the UK. Airport, solar-powered airport used as a research facility for a major US corporation. Uh, the waste treatment plant for San Francisco. San Francisco has decided to become a zero waste city. We've been hired by their waste treatment people to develop the facilities that will make San Francisco a zero waste city. This is a distribution center designed for Walmart for the UK. It's 10 million square feet, solar powered, uh, green roofs, and uh, daylighting as a theoretical concept project for the future. It would be hidden in the landscape so it couldn't be seen or heard. A concept building for Fortune magazine, solar powered skyscraper in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, a concept for a solar power, 100% solar powered skyscraper in uh, the Middle East. And as a venture capitalist, I'm involved with a company called Bright Source Energy, which has signed a 900 megawatt uh, power production contract with Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, mirrors that heat a tower, uh, produce steam generated electricity, 900 megawatts. Uh, we're the funders for a, com a, a project called Better Place in Israel, where uh, Israel will be getting off of oil. I don't know if you've heard about this, but they basically made a deal with Renault Nissan. The government of Israel is going to be charging something like $25,000 tax on a gasoline-powered car and zero tax on an electric car. And Renault Nissan will make the cars in Israel and Jordan, and and. Better Place will be developing the infrastructure around Israel so that you can plug and play and park and change your batteries and things like that. And Israel is expected to get off of oil uh, within the next decade. And I just want to show you for fun a project that I'm doing with a friend of mine, uh, Brad Pitt. And we're doing a project for uh, a not-for-profit that we've created called Make It Right, where we're bringing people back to the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans where the levy broke. Uh, we decided that it was cynical to think that people shouldn't return home, and nobody was coming home because they were having so much difficulty with the understanding the whole turmoil, all the uh, results of all the turmoil in their finances and their family situations. And so we, we facilitate that with them and help by designing. Uh, we hired 13 firms to design houses that they could choose from. We're studying stick-built, modular, and panel-built houses. Uh, and uh, we've got the first six houses built and occupied by families. Uh, and we're bringing in a whole other raft of architects to add to our collection, and uh, some, some of whom you've heard of that are quite well-known uh, global architects. So the houses are getting built now, and so the neighborhood is, is recovering. We're very excited about it. They're solar-powered. Uh, cradle to cradle to the maximum extent possible. And then finally, I'd like to just close with some of the work in China. The China will house hundreds of millions of people in the next 10 years. This is like rehousing the entire United States in half a decade. That's how big it is. 
We were asked to do a horizontal plan for the extension of the city of Luzhou in the south of China um, in this famous limestone karst landscape of the Chinese landscape paintings. And here's a city that floods. And so we looked at the site, we developed the horizontal plan, but then on our own nickel, we went ahead and played with the idea of what would it mean to be a waste equals food city that didn't have flood flooding problems. And so we started to imagine a city that took its fertilizer from its waste treatment plants, used it for cooking gas. You can make about 20% of a city's cooking gas from the waste treatment plants. We looked at how to solar power a city using the roofs of the city and the bioregion. But I think the thing that got the most attention was our proposal to lift the soil up onto the roofs of the city uh, and build a city effectively underneath it. So imagine Paris or Barcelona with farms on the roofs. So that's what we did. And so the Premier of China has said that China will lose 20% of its farmland by 2020 with their current urbanization rates. And so we started to imagine what would it be like for cities to be gardens and cities to encourage biodiversity and celebration of water and, and healthy soil and things like that. And for all the people who thought I was too loopy to believe, I got sent this picture from China uh, last week. Somebody uh, actually did it and went out and planted rice on his terrace. And this is the harvest of the rice, the first harvest. So it was a real privilege to get this picture. So that's my story. And I conclude with the question I asked at the beginning. What is our intention as a species? Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. And the big question is, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Thank you very much. Now you can see why I called him the Pied Piper. <laughs> I'm ready to follow. Um, but I think the big question that so many of us have, and we are going to open it up to about 15 minutes of questions, but, and, and for those of you who are in the audience that maybe aren't on the bandwagon, I think it's equally important to hear those voices as well, because the one question that comes to mind is he makes it all sound so easy. So why aren't we doing it? And I know that there are other questions out there as well. So we're going to have, do we have some mics? Um, and we've got a couple of people that'll come around with your questions, but maybe you want to start with that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that this is really hard to do, actually. Uh, I like, I enjoy showing it with a lightness to it because I think that it needs to have a sense of lightness to it. But it is actually a very hard thing to do. And the hardest thing is to change the way people think. And that's always difficult. Um, we found in our work that there are seven types of people that we have to deal with. Uh, I remember being in a large group at Ford where we had about 300 people involved in the Ford plant. And Michael leaned over to me and said, you know, listen, the, look at the types of people we have here. We have seven types. He's a scientist. There are people who are signing up for this 100% and they're going to change their lives and do it this way. There are people who are really excited about this and want to change what they do every day to be like this, but they, they'll keep doing what they've been doing, but they want to do it this way. There are people who are um, uh, really interested in this and, and happy to do it because they've been asked to do it by their management. There are people that really could care less one way or the other but want to do their job, and since that's what they're being asked to do, that's the way they'll do it. There are people who really don't like it or don't understand it, but it's their job, so they'll do it. Then there are the sixes, which are the deep sixers, who are people who really don't like it and really would like to stop it, don't know how, and uh, want to do it with passive-aggressive behavior. And, and then there are the sevens, who are the active aggressives, who really don't like it and want to stop it and just want to get in, get in your face. And, um, and we found that the sevens are the most valuable people to us in our work because the most vigorous people who are testing it are actually the ones that when they find out, like we did on the Ford roof, um, that, that it works, become the greatest champions 
going forward because they've really vigorously tested it for themselves. And so um, it just gives you a signal of how hard this is to do. It's not, it's not something you can just easily say, you know, let's just do it that way because it requires creativity. And it requires people to get their mind wrapped around a creative act. And, and we make mistakes. And, and it's also, you know, you have to be ready to make mistakes if you're going to experiment. I think Edison said that progress is not, and success and invention is not leaping from success to success. It's lurching from failure to failure. <laughs> um, and so you really do have to take uh, an open mind to it. And it's not easy. Out there that want to ask a question. Declare yourself. Building on that a little bit further, I'm curious about where, though, you see the deepest resistance. I mean, are the sevens uh, the deep corporate investors that don't that see a loss for themselves? Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. And therefore, it has to be a political change. Yeah, I think that uh, the biggest. The biggest blocks are the people who are sort of fat and happy. Um, the coal industry, for example, <laughs> is very um, focused on, on coal. And I think we have to look at coal. If you look at coal through cradle to cradle lenses, what you realize is we need to come up with a new design. This is a great challenge for our engineers. We need to develop what, what we call horizontal chimneys so that we can burn the coal or to extract the energy from the coal, but then take the carbon dioxide and put it in these giant umbilical cords, effectively, that uh, are things that, that will absorb the carbon dioxide in greenhouses and make algae so that we can continuously capture that CO2 and use it for productive purposes instead of releasing it to the atmosphere. You see, from a design perspective, the, this country is in, in a crazy state from a from pure design, we 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 borrow seven hundred billion dollars a year from the Chinese. We send seven hundred billion dollars a year to countries that don't like us for oil, and then we take the thing that we bought and what do we do with it? We burn it. I mean, this is really brilliant, right? This cannot go on very long. <laughs> it's just a bad design. So if you look at coal, for example, our our native hydrocarbon, um, we, would, we should be looking at it as an asset, not a liability. And right now, people are using it as a, it's a, it's a liability. It causes carbon dioxide and, um, and air pollution and mercury contamination. So it's a liability. But it should be seen as an asset. Following on to your analogy there, and also since you had insights with Ford and we're faced with this bailout issue of the automobile industry, it's hard, I just, your insights as to how they got the building built but failed to realize uh, that, the that the cars were, the they wrong, were making, they're making the wrong was, thing. Uh, yeah. We're going to end up being yeah, that wasn't lost on us. Examples. So I'm just yeah. curious about your insight on, on that and then also on, on a human species population and how that works with your model. Okay. Um, yeah, it wasn't lost on us that the cars, that the, well, they make the F-150 in our factory. So um, clearly we wanted to work on that. And, and frankly, uh, I was working on a project called Piquette, which was Bill Ford's pet project for designing the car of the future based on ecological principles, which got stopped when Alan Mulally came in and took over because Bill said Alan has to take the reins and do everything necessary. And Alan said, all projects are on hold. And then we're going to pick those projects that are essential to our survival and go forward. And so a lot of that work just stopped uh, because they're in such desperate economic shape. And if, uh, and for my nickel, that's the most important work they could have been doing for their, for their survival. And I think they'd have a lot better time in Washington if they could come in and show that they had actually had some real intelligence around future development of automobiles. And so the fact that everybody in the country is saying, why are we bailing out these people who do, haven't done it the right way, in order to perpetuate the same people doing the same things is, is really a fundamental question and shows how flawed the fundamental design of the auto industry in the United States has become uh, just by not taking a, a creative approach. I, I think that's, that's really all I can say about that. 
Um, as far as population goes, you know, one of the th important things about cradle to cradle, and the next book will be about this, is that without cradle to cradle, we're going to have a real problem with human rights. The, the next book talks about whether if we do business as usual, we have a sense of what will happen then. And then we have eco-efficiency and what will happen if we're efficient, which is, is basically we'll have the same thing that happens as business as usual. It just takes a little longer. And then we're looking at what we call ecologism, which is a world of frightened people who are trying to regulate everything in order to survive, which is a pretty scary situation where commerce and the guardian aren't aligned. And then we look at cradle to cradle where the guardian and commerce become aligned uh, by safe, healthy things and perpetual cycles. Because with safe, healthy things and perpetual cycles, then we can share. And sharing is really the key element of, a, of the future of our relationships, the ability to share. When, we, when we're all worried about limits and who has what and where the oil is because we need the oil, instead of having our indigenous energy system built in this country with local labor. Because remember, a photon in America can never be taken by the Chinese, right? The Chinese will never capture an American photon. So, you know, we can, we can absolutely develop our own indigenous energy systems. And so that's part of the cradle to cradle thing. But uh, the, the, the fundamental point of all that is that, that the danger right now is that when we talk about the population, if somebody says that a child being born in India is a population problem, then human rights cease to exist. Because the minute that a child being born is seen as a, human, as a, as a, as a population problem, uh, the, the human rights are gone. And so we need to love every single child that's born. And we need to come up with a design that allows us to love every child that's born. And so if we're always going to be worried about our resources and we have too many people for the resources, then we'll be worrying about population uh, uh, control from a, from a selfish perspective. Now, that's not to say that it wouldn't be a bright thing for the species to think about reducing our numbers intelligently. But it, wouldn't, it won't be by pointing our finger at some little kid in India and saying that you're a population problem. I think it will become when we treat women equally to men. I think that's what we've seen in uh, our history. And clearly, when women are, are educated and treated equally with men, populations decline uh, or stabilize. And so I think those are the kinds of things we should be focused on rather than just some kid and some population program. Okay. Today is a very symbolic day, and your presence here is really good. Today is the anniversary of EPA's creation 38 years ago. Wow. I didn't know that. So the idea is, what would you say to the new administration and to the regulators, since we have tons of statutes to regulate, to make this a next anniversary 38 years from now, that we have a, a jointure between what you're, what you're leading and what we have to enforce? I think that's a great question. I mean, from a very f focused, sort of gimlet-eyed view, um, I think we have to take those fundamental elements of energy, uh, materials, and water, and, and say that the energy needs to be renewable and it needs to be indigenous, and, and get on it, and get on it fast, because the job creation is tremendous. I don't know if you've ever been in a windmill factory, but when you see the blades go through, they're as big as a 747. And there are 10 of them lined up, and they're going through 10 a day. And you watch 10 747s moving through things that big, moving through a factory in a day. And you realize how much job creation there is. And this is in local production because it's inherently local. It's a phenomenal thing to think about. And the whole solar deployment, the fact is we could cover our highways with solar collectors. They're already industrial territory. We already own them. They're already um, in, uh, zoned so that people aren't afraid to look at them um, for what they are, which is industrial uh, capacity. We could, we could cover them with ribbons of solar collectors. The railroads could have solar collectors on the north and south sides. Uh, running as ribbons of power across the country. We have a giant electric train set, and we don't have to subsidize Amtrak. It can become an energy exporter. I mean, things like that. Really m fantastic job creation programs that should be seen as job creation programs in this marketplace today. So I think that's the energy picture uh, at writ large. I think on the, uh, on the water picture, 
uh, the, the whole use of water in our country is, is totally uh, ready for revamping. Uh, we know about this stuff out west with all the use it or lose it that creates massive inefficiencies and things like that. You have your own water problems here uh, that need to be attended. Um, and then on the materials side, I think we ought to do a, a deep inventory, uh, starting with, with foundations and with uh, the emulsionary world and the, and the uh, corporate world on a deep database of all chemicals used by humans, characterized like we've characterized them, so that people get their act together uh, on this and, and we stop making poisonous stuff. One of the biggest obstacles to the 100% group is, is cost. And I work with the, um, small towns and cities in urban design and writing zoning codes. And many are interested in those green roofs. They're just really captivated by it. But I, it always gets, you know, um, cut out in the end because of the cost factor. And how is it done in roofs leak? And how, what are you going to do if your roof leaks and then you've got a you know, yard of soil on top of it? And, and that's just one example. Um, and so. What, what can you do at a local, I mean, you've talked about a lot of global ideas here, but what can individual, individuals and individual towns and cities do? Well, I think um, there are two, two ways to look at that issue. One would be to do some science and determine what the actual process and costs are. And for example, at the, four, the, the gap roof is nine inches thick. It's very heavy. It's a meadow. And one of the reasons it's that heavy is because the Gap building, um, not only did it have a big stormwater issue to get entitled, this is cost-benefit analysis that was done for the chairman of the Gap, Don Fisher, to justify the uh, project. Um, not only did they, the site couldn't get entitled because the stormwater systems of San Bruno, California had backed up. And so there was no way to build at the headwater of San Bruno. And when we came in with our design, uh, all of a sudden, all the resistance to the building disappeared because there was no stormwater problem at all. And so they got entitlement to build because of the green roof, which is really a big value proposition uh, on one hand. The other reason it's heavy is because it's near San Francisco Airport, and the 747s take off over the building, and you can't hear them because of the heavy roof. So you get these skylights and daylight, and it's silent. it feels like Sunday in New York is what it feels like in that building. It's quiet, but you still feel the energy, but it's quiet. And these big planes flying overhead, and you can't even hear them. So that's pretty exciting. So there's a value proposition in that roof where it's not just for, you know, for the birds, so to speak. All right. On the Ford project, the roof is an inch and a half thick. It's seven pounds a square foot. It's called an extensive green roof, and it's incredibly cheap. And it, all it was there, it's there for is to manage the stormwater so that they reduce the surges on the stormwater system. That $50, $48 million system that they had engineered already when we came in was three chemical treatment plants, uh, a four-foot concrete pipes, and a whole bunch of UAW workers standing around at 55 bucks an hour praying it doesn't rain, right? <laughs> that was its value proposition. It was money down the drain, literally. It had no value to Ford at all. It was just a cost. And so we said, if we could use this green roof, we can hold the water for, for a few hours on the roof, and it turned out the water takes three days to get to the Rouge River, all right, and it gets purified on the way. So there's big value propositions involved. Now, when you get to little towns and somebody just doing a building, what, you, what you'll want to look at quickly is what is required for stormwater retention. And if you don't have to buy that real estate because you got your roof working, then you have a value proposition. If you're just adding it to the cost of your building, nobody's got the money for that, right? Although it does make your roof last a long time, the leak issue is nonsense because it's like a blanket. You just lift it up. And it protects the roof from thermal shock. It protects it from ultraviolet degradation. The roofs last in almost forever. We don't know how long they're going to last. We've looked at membranes that are 40 years old, and they look brand new under these green roofs. So that's, that's all a shibboleth that, that this stuff is you know, not technically viable. But, but it brings me to the fundamental point, which is what, what Buckminster Fuller called anticipatory design science. And the fundamental point we're making is that all buildings today should be designed to either take or solar collectors or have green roofs or both. And, and that's the anticipation of cost-effective solar and, and eco-effective green roofs. And you can choose either one, but the buildings need to become photosynthetic. Because if we think about the planet, the planet is meant to be fecund and growing things, 
That was the whole point of biology. So, so buildings need to be photosynthetic. So we can design buildings today, and we design a lot of buildings that we can't afford to put the solar collectors on because they're not cost effective yet, but we know they will be in five years. So they're all designed to receive them. And so you can design your buildings so you know where the solar collectors are going in the future instead of just placing roofs willy-nilly and not worrying about it. You can actually anticipate this stuff coming if you can't afford to do it today. Well, you mentioned that um, loving all species and all children is critical, so we thought we would close with, um, before Penny speaks, with a question from, I think, the only child in the audience. My son has a question for you. Great. Um, well, you know you said that um, you have the grass roofs on top, but how do you cause that from the grass roofs from not burning? Um, like catching on fire, like you said in California, which um, there's a lot of fires there, and they're very. What a great question. Very easily to catch on fire. So how does yeah, it not catch on fire? it's a great question. I uh, there's a detail. Um, no, you're right on target because that was the question that was asked in San Bruno, and when we got the fire department involved, because you know the roof that has a meadow that go, turns brown in the summer, uh, the question was, what do we do about a fire? And you know what they were worried about? They were worried about bottle rockets. Kids on the 4th of July sending bottle rockets up to the roof and starting a fire up on the roof. So what we did was um, we, have, we had a sprinkler system to start the roof. We had a sprinkler system installed to get the roof started. It's not actually used to manage the roof at all. The roof just goes through the normal cycle of a meadow. Uh, but we have a sprinkler system to get it started. So we said we would make the sprinkler system so that it could be a sprinkler system for fire. In case there was a fire, they could turn on the sprinklers and wet the roof. So we designed it for that. We needed it anyway, so it was already in the, in the cost uh, protocol. Um, but the other fun part was that we agreed with the fire department that we weed whack it on the 3rd of July. <laughs> and, uh, and what turned out to be so interesting about that was that the um, native peoples, when we talked to them about this oak savanna that they lived in, they described that on about the 3rd of July, you know, around the beginning of July every year is when they burned the meadows to, uh, to create, you know, the oak savanna and for hunting and for fresh grass and things like that and keep the trees down. And so um, it's, it was in, it's interesting that now that we weed whack it, on the 3rd of July, we, it's this time we can collect all the seeds. So that roof has become a business that sells native seeds. And, and it's because of the fire question. So thanks for your question. Great Great question, Josh, and a great evening. Exactly what we hoped for with all of you and your wonderful questions. Thank you for being with us this evening. We look forward to seeing you at future Blank Foundation Speaker Series, and we hope you'll stick around for a little while and enjoy some conversation. Thank you. <laughs>